Hello, hi, welcome, good afternoon. I'm Natalie Swagina, the Associate Deputy Director here at the Houston Center for Contemporary Craft. And I wanna thank you for joining us this afternoon to learn a little bit more about some of our resident artists. For those of you who, don't know, who do not know, we host resident artists in our studios at the Craft Center from three, six months, nine months to a year. The residents come from all over the United States in a variety of mediums, including craft, fi <laughs> clay, fiber, woodworking, glass, and metal. So today we're gonna learn from three different um, artists more about their practice, their studio practice, the works they've produced while in Houston. And we're gonna jump right into one of our, our first of our three artists, Margot Becker. And while I'm speaking, um, while they're speaking as well, please feel free to add any questions you have for the residents in the chat. We'll make sure to ask questions after each one at the end of their, um, at the end of their time. You ready, Margo? Hi. Awesome. Yes. Hi, Margo. So Margo is an artist, weaver, and educator based in Hudson, New York. Her work explores a sense of place, the natural environment, and the connection between the individual and communal subconscious. In 2009, Margot received her BA in studio art from Bard College, and in 2020, her MFA from the California College of Arts, where she was awarded the Cardong Scholarship and the Tony A. Lowenthal Memorial Scholarship for the Excellence in Textiles. Her work has been exhibited in New York, San Francisco, and Los Angeles. And Margot's been with us for three months and is leaving at the end of May, so everyone has about a month to catch her in her studio. Margot, I'm going to hand it over to you. Hi, thank you, Natalie. Um, okay, I'm gonna share my screen to show you my work. Okay, so the kind of weaving that I do uh, to create on the hand loom uh, is a multi-weft plain weave and pattern weave uh, where I'm intuitively creating the forms that you see as I'm weaving. So I don't design my work ahead of time. I just launch into it and see where it goes, often starting with a place or a concept that I want to explore. In this case, this weaving took 10 months and it started out thinking about a forest scape and then moving through forest fires and thinking about species regeneration in California. Uh, this is another piece that I did before I got here where I was looking at tides and islands and also movement and self-discovery through uh, passageways in water. And I started experimenting with multi-paneled weaves in this way, which you'll see later too. And then I also was starting to experiment with painting the warp before I got here, although this was done with acrylic paint um and adding in forms ahead of time okay and then i came to houston and the first thing i did here i'm using a loom it's a eight harnessed uh my or baby wolf loom that i have on loan from the hand weavers guild in houston here which has been great and i'm working on four harness loom usually and so it's really excited to have new capabilities with this loom and immediately decided to teach myself how to double weave finally which is something that i'd been avoiding a little bit and so work i spent the time to like work out how to get the block weave down just to say that i could do it and also to get the, to know the loom and to settle in and then I also got really excited about the craft garden. And so I have a practice where I do these forage drawing weaves or drawings where I, um, on walks or just exploring a place, gather different flora and ephemera that I find, bring it into my studio and then paint around it to create this collage drawing. And I've done this for a while now to sort of learn about a place, locate myself in the environment and also think about what kind of colors are happening around me. I also have really been enjoying all the basketry materials out in the craft garden. Um, and similarly, in terms of this temporary short-lived art form of twisting and weaving and just exploring how plants work in a place. Um, and then I also, since getting here, I've been getting really into watercoloring, which I do often as like to sort of illustrate a place, but I've been really, going for it here and in, um, in a really different way and experimenting, being really playful and imaginative with what I'm doing. And that's been really fun to get to know. But through this, I was 
trying to decide how to start here and getting really excited about flowers and watercolors and how to bring these elements into my work while here at the craft center for my three-month residency. And so I decided to try ice dyeing my work for the first time. Ice dye is a technique where you take your dye material and then put it in soda ash and then cover it with ice and then sprinkle a procyon dye powder on top of that. And as the ice melts, it um, all the dye colors kind of wash into each other, which creates a very watercolory effect. So I didn't know, I knew which colors I was adding. I had never, I didn't do any tests beforehand. So I didn't really know what was going to happen, um, which I really liked. And then I decided to think about that as sort of an underpainting. So it is informing the colors that I use and showing through the weaving in some areas. Um, but I was thinking about impressionists and I heard that they use like really bright underpainting colors. And I was excited about that and how to kind of have a background image while creating something that was um, more uh, arranged on in form wise on the weaving. Um, so this is this was the first piece that I finished here, and this is what it looks like. You can see the ice dyed work kind of shows through, and I'm doing a combination for my pattern weave. I'm doing a huck lace weave, which is an eight harnessed uh, lace weave, which has a lot of transparency and floats. And then for um, the imagery that you see that's in plain weave, but also clasping wefts. So you have the interplay of the different weft colors and the warp, and then also the pattern warp and the plain weave all working together to create this image. And I started out, I was thinking about butterflies and flowers, but I never really know where things are going to go and my weaving takes a long time. So it always evolves and there are lots of different ideas that come into play, but I really liked thinking about that lace weave and keeping things really open and airy. And so I still had more warp left and um, decided to continue on. And at first I thought I was going to make two different weavings and make a series. Um, but then I sort of was looking at that first weaving that I made and all those tendrils kind of exiting. And I realized that I wanted to link in. And so now I'm working building the piece up as I go line by line, and then also building the piece sideways panel by panel and not really knowing what the composition or form will be until it's happening. Um, but you can see here, this is the, on the right side, a close up of that clasp weft weaving. And so lots of different colors working together and um, playing with that warp. And this is a close up of the huck lace weave that I'm doing. And this pattern by now, this is, <laughs> I took this picture today. And so by now I have it down and I really like sort of, you know, paying attention closely to whether the pattern is working out sometimes. And then also just letting it go other times. I really have no interest in like a careful repeat. Um, although it looks like I do here, you know, <laughs> uh, but yeah, sort of like allowing a pattern to come and go and sort of show the humanness of the form by letting it be broken up occasionally. I'm also adding in some metallic threads nowadays, which has been really fun too. Um, and one thing I've been really excited about is I made this flowery form um, in the first weaving and I really liked the way it was going. And I liked the way that I built it um, not thinking about the geometry of the flower, but just kind of like inventing a flower with these, you know, blue tendrils and other blue petals and knowing how the colors worked and knowing how they might grow and flop, but not trying to repeat as you would often see in like a traditional textile pattern, which is very geometric. And, um, you know, you'll have like, you can see that, you know, against that hug lace weave, which is like very exact and thinking about how to create flowers and illustrate them in the same way that I'm getting to know how to identify flowers. So like when I'm moving around and looking at a plant, I'm not looking for exact replicas because exact replicas don't exist in a garden or in nature or anywhere. Instead, you're looking for like these sort of, um, you know, plant 
I want to say rules, but I don't, I don't like thinking about rules because I feel like nature is just like organized anarchy, right? So that's what I'm trying to go for in my work is like, what, what are these organizational systems that I can invent that I can repeat, but then still have them be like organic and flowing and changing every time. And so I have four going <laughs> so far in this work. And I think this motif or this way of working will come back and repeat itself in the future too. So now I have these two panels and I'm really excited. They did match up. I've been measuring when they when those tendrils exit and enter the weavings to know where I am. And I'm working on the third panel now. Um, and we'll see how it goes. It's a slow process. And I think um, I think it's going to be tricky to meet up that last <laughs> that last larger petal on the top. Um, but we'll see. And yeah, and that's how I'm really I've been really grateful to have this time to explore. I feel like having I usually work in a space that has like many different kinds of weaving happening all at once and uh, many different projects happening all at once. And it's been so nice here to just come in and totally explore and really settle into one place and one new way of weaving. Um, and I'm looking forward to seeing how much I can get done um, in the next, in this last month and hope that people come and visit me and see. Awesome, thank you, Margo. Um, if anyone has any questions for Margo, again, please drop them in the chat. Um, but I have a couple questions for you myself before we get started. Um, you know, you talk a lot about well, all of your work is about natural, um, you know, natural connections, nature, your observations. What started your interest in working within natural materials and this just your subject of it of nature? Sure. So um, I guess I grew up in a very rural place, and I've always really been interested in uh, the natural world and what's going on there. Um, and then I came to weaving through a practice of uh, wanting to know what a textile is and how it works from start to finish. And so I moved upstate and I started working on a sheep farm and making all of my yarn from start to finish. And this was like a full, you know, multi-year practice of learning about lambing and learning about shearing, spinning, how it all works. And then you could see very clearly how health of an animal relies on the health of the environment and the sweater that you make is, you know, directly related to that environment in terms of the strength and softness and everything else in the wool. And so I, you know, it's something that's like very clear and obvious, but then also feels very complex and it's sometimes so overwhelming, it's hard to grasp. And so I would go out and try to tell people about this and how important this is, but then I started wanting to like uh, figure out how to show it as well and like speak to people on in a more uh, more like poetic way through weaving and then also getting excited about how to like push the medium for me further than a shawl or a sweater a functional piece of cloth how to like use that grid system and pushing against that grid system to show other things that's really interesting. We always think about the grid system as like the first computer, the binary code of it and such a structured weft and weave. And it's so interesting to see you manipulating that within your practice of this very organic patch practice that's about repetition, but not repetition. You know, it's really, it's really this, this um, conflating of the two ideas. Mm -hmm. So how has being in Texas changed your point of view? You know, I, I especially see it in some of your landscape portraits or the watercolors you were doing that I know you went out to slightly more West Texas at one point and I was just thinking, oh, this is this is the plains, this is the desert, which is so different from upstate New York and California. So maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, I'm seeing more spikes come out in things and the colors are definitely shifting. Um, I think also, you know, it's like Texas, so a different environment and different ecology, but also living in a city is very different. And so there's like just a lot of sound and color and brightness and flavors and everything feels like very, um, yeah, very bright, which I've been incorporating, which is great. But then I was also thinking about 
you know, just the fact of being in a different place is so important in terms of how you perceive your surroundings and how you get to know all the plants and things around you. I think I love upstate New York. It's definitely home, but I also can watch myself sort of falling into patterns where I'm not noticing in the same way. And when you're forcing yourself to learn a new place, it's like, you know, it's almost like psychedelic in terms of like how turned on you are to your environment. Cause you know, part of it's like a, almost like a fear response because you're like, oh, you know, <laughs> am I safe? What does this look like? Nothing is, you know, familiar, but then how you perceive things and what you notice and what you can like incorporate and bring into your life and your making has been amazing. So I've been so grateful to have that experience. Yeah, that's kind of the one of draw, I think, for um, short term residencies, like three months in a new place is that it, it forces you to to shake up things and look at something different and focus on your practice, which is, you know, I'm sure really wonderful. We have some questions from the audience. Um, we have a question from Rebecca Sweeta, who was formerly in your studio just before you came. So I love the connection here. Um, Rebecca is asking, how has the Craft Center's garden influenced what you're working on? Yeah, so much. I think partially like the craft center garden itself has influenced me in terms of, you know, physically bringing the materials into my studio and being able to play with them, um, spending out time outside sketching them, but also working with Sandy, the botanist here, who gives all of the residents a really extensive tour and talking to her and learning about how to identify plants and what to notice about plants and um, all of the different parts of them have been really exciting because as I'm working, I'm working at such a small or like incremental scale on all of my botanical forms. And so while they're all, all invented, they are built. And so it's been really amazing to have that extra set of eyes sort of like teaching me how to look at plants so that when I'm building them in my studio, I can like pay attention to all the different parts and connections of them. That's great. And for those of you who don't know, our craft garden showcases um, plants that are used in dye, textiles, weaving, and paper making. And all of the plants have to be, you know, either native to Texas or a, um, um, what's the right word I'm looking for, Margo? Like they're in our zone as well. So Sandy does a lot of work to make sure that, you know, they're working with our local ecology as well as thinking about different craft processes. And speaking of processes, we have a technical question. Um, when, you're do, when you're using ice dyeing, what brand of dye are you using? Um, great question. It's a uh, Jacquard Procyon dye. So you can use any powdered dye though, I, I think. Um, but I think the chemical dyes, as I understand it, like they work a little faster and you don't need heat. Um, and the main thing with dyeing anything is making sure that the dye matches up with the uh, fiber material. So if it's a protein fiber, you need an acid dye. And if it's a um, oh my God, what's sorry, cellulose fiber, a plant fiber, then you need a procyon dye. So I'm using linen and cotton uh, materials. And so I found a dye that works strictly with them. And I guess that means you really can't do a lot of natural dyeing with ice dyes. I mean, I guess indigo is a cold dye, right? But if you're doing, because most natural dyes have to be heated up. So that would be hard to do with an ice dye. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. And I have never tried it. So I'm not going to say that you can't, but <laughs> I think you can get, <laughs> yeah, you could probably get like a similar effect with a bundle dye. I just mm -hmm. didn't have a capability. Like I, I don't have a hot plate set up. It's something that I might try in the future is some bundle dyeing. Mm -hmm. um, and you could get a sort of like a wash a watercolor effect with that, I think. Awesome. Well, now I want to come make this with you. That sounds fun. Yeah. Um, so Margo, <laughs> before we wrap up your questions, what's next for you after the residency? Great question. Um, I'm going to go back to Hudson. I'm going to keep weaving and <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and we'll see. Um, yeah, I don't know. You know, my life, I lead my life in the same way that I weave, which is line by line. Yeah. And yeah. That's really beautiful. It's very poetic. We've really enjoyed having you at the Craft Center and your connection to the garden. And we're excited for one more month of everyone, um, Margo, in her studio on Thursdays and on right Thursdays and Saturdays. So please catch her. And I believe you also have a work up at Barbara Davis Gallery here in town as well, right now, right? Yeah, I do. And, um, it's in her office currently, but on view for everyone. You can stop by and see it. And it's one of my jacquard pieces. So it's a very different way of weaving. It's uh, 
woven with a computer driven loom, but it's a very large scale piece that I'm very proud of. So yeah, go check it out. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Margo. We appreciate it. Thank you. Bye. Okay, next up, we're going to move on to Miles Gracie. Miles uses the vocabulary of furniture to translate sculptural forms by activating a once passive relationship with the participant. Miles grew up in California, where he received an MFA in sculpture new genre from Otis College of Art and Design. He fell into cabinet making and trade or in, into the cabinet making trade and eventually attended the Kronoff School of Fine Woodworking. He has attended residencies at Haystack Mountain School of Craft and was a fellow at the Center for the Center for Furniture Craftsmanship is Maine. And his work has been exhibited in Los Angeles and San Francisco. So Miles, I'm going to turn it over for, to you. And I should mention too that Miles has been here for six months and he's also leaving at the end of May. So you have another month to catch Miles in his studio. So Miles, I'll hand it over. It's good. Hi, thanks, Natalie. Thanks for that really nice introduction. Um, beautiful work that we just saw from Margot, um, my neighbor. Um, thank you, William, for holding my computer while I give this lecture. Um, I wanted to start this talk off in uh, key. So I picked the key of F. Um, and I also want to talk a lot about my experience here in Houston, particularly. And what felt the most kind of genuine was actually just bringing you all into my studio and kind of showing you around, seeing what I'm currently working on. Um, and it'll kind of give you a feel for a little bit of how I work too, which is a little bit more reactionary and a little bit um, kind of more intuitive. So we're gonna go in there in a second, but first I'll, uh, I'll give you some context on two of the work that are on display in the hallway. Um, this piece is called Loose Ends. Uh, it is sort of meant to be, um, there's a door over here, there's a door over here, and this idea that I really wanted to kind of like think about um, is that depending on your interaction or where you're standing, you get a different in encounter with the piece, you get a different view um, depending on how the doors are configured. The experience is sort of a... Uh, <laughs> sort of a two-way road where um, the work activates you and you sort of activate the work in tandem. Um, the next piece I wanted to talk about is the piece I've, the, the uh, kind of one of the more serious pieces I've made in the last few years. Um, this is Ends Meet. Um, it's kind of a tongue-in-cheek title because it's two circles and circles are basically just shapes where their ends meet. Um, and it has, um, again, it's kind of, it's configurative in multiple ways in what you can, uh, you get a different experience depending on how you look at it and how you interact it, with it. So it really asks a lot from the, from the viewer and it also gives a lot in return. So that's old stuff. Um, we can go into the studio now. <clears throat> And so this being a craft center, I do want to talk a little bit about process as well um, and talk about some of the tools I use in my process. First, um, maybe I'll obvious talk about this. Um, I have a floral arrangement set up here and another one kind of over in the back. We can go closer to that later. Um, this, is, this is dried and this is a collaboration I did with um, Hannah over at Edges Wild Studio. Um, it's for an idea of a cabinet that I had where I want to carve a, a floral arrangement out of wood. And so this is acting as kind of a model for me. Um, and we can walk over here and we can see um, the progress, you know, work in um, It's a process, and so a lot of this is kind of reality. 
um, a lot of the floor arrangement is going to be a challenge and technically materially uh, it's going to be hard to translate um, and so I came into it without much of a plan other than kind of like a concept and idea and um, again I'm really just exploring the, the materials um, I'm looking to kind of capture and translate without actually reproducing, um, you know, uh, kind of talking about the same idea that Margo just mentioned where, where it's sort of um, kind of a fool's errand to be chasing recreation of, of, um, of like plant life or material because it's so unique and so individual and so kind of like imperfectly perfect. And so the idea being that um, it's kind of, uh, you know, a, a fleeting goal. Um, and then if we can actually go down to the bench here, uh, you can see I use a lot of traditional carving tools and knives. Um, there are a lot of them and each one has a different shape and serves a different purpose. Um, and then we can kind of come over here into this corner where um, this is a good opportunity to talk about some of the uh, um, workshops I have coming up next month. I'll be teaching a soap carving class. So we'll be with some kiddos, we'll be carving soap, um, which is like a really nice introduction into the techniques and processes involved in carving. Um, and then for adults, we'll be carving spoons. So I have some kind of examples of spoons. Um, and that's also coming up in May. Um, behind me, you can see some of the other tools I use. Um, one of my mentors once said that, um, kind of in jest, he said that a true, it, you're not a true craftsperson until you have seven hammers. Um, so I think I have about seven here so far. So I feel like I finally right in his eyes. Um, here's another flower arrangement. This one um, is dead. It uh, was alive when I started and I took lots of pictures of it. And, but again, this kind of, this idea of translating rather than transcribing. Um, I have um, uh, some handmade tools as well. This is sort of, um, these are hand planes. And these are sort of, again, a lot of different shapes to fulfill different needs and requirements for the work. Um, and then they are, a lot of them are made by hand um, and shaped by hand. And, um, you know, it's really kind of completes the circle to feel like you can make the tools that then you can make the work with. So that's something that I really pay attention to in my work. Um, we can go behind me, you, um, and um, Hi, okay, back on track. Um, um, the crane is something that also like is really makes each wood unique. And so um, marquetry is a great uh, opportunity to kind of experiment with the different woods together and see how to kind of create form and shape through um, wood rather than than um, kind of contrast or with contrast. Um, this piece here um, is a collaboration that I'm working on with my friend Jan. 
Um, I don't know where it's going and I set it up to kind of think about it and um, you know a lot of my work is very reactionary and so I don't have an I don't have a plan for it and I think that sometimes it can kind of talk uh, it can it can kind of respond to me and uh, lead me on where the next kind of like step is. Um, I work with veneer a lot as well. It's a way to kind of um, there's certain rules in woodworking and they kind of create a lot of um, woods what's kind of a, a move uh, sorry wood is is a um, so it has certain and not and working with fingers really uh, those rules a little bit and um and be able to use the wood more as like a paint so i can really play around with the, with the patterns the grain um really kind of think about how parts interact with each other and it really frees up the process a little bit um, which is helpful when you don't have too much of a plan on where you're going um, we can stop by my wood stash really quick. Um, and these are things that I brought across the country with me multiple times um, and have collected over the years. A lot of them are really special to me and have come from people I respect and um, and care deeply about. And really, again, kind of process of responding to the material. So I don't know what to use any of this for, but I know that when I have a project in mind and I see the piece of wood, it really kind of evolves from there and it's really an adaptive process. Um, we can real quickly stop by my sharpening station as well. And so I sharpen tools by hand. Um, first grinding the bevel with this grinding machine. And then I have a set of oil stones and a set of water stones. Um, and that's, uh, woodworkers require really sharp tools. Um, I've been told that they're even sharper than surgeons. And it's it's one thing that's really important to, to um, understand is not only how to use the tools, but how to sharpen them. Uh, I think that's about it for my studio. So uh, thanks for joining me. Uh, back to Natalie. Great, and sorry for the brief technical error we had earlier. Um, Miles, thank you for taking us through your studio. I always love seeing all of the tools and all of the like wood you've brought with you and you know all the hand carving tools. And especially now that you have your seven hammers and can, you know, confidently call yourself a crafts person. Um, but I wanted to ask a little bit like how you got started with woodworking, you know, what draws you to working with wood and cabinetry and furniture, you know, how did, how did that start in your practice? Right. Um, you mentioned briefly in my bio that I have an art background. I uh, did my BFA at um, an art school and I had an art practice for a while that um, was very conceptual and it sort of um, felt so disconnected from my, from me, from me, from a person that I uh, sort of started gravitating towards things that were more practical and more real and more um, made with my hand. And that I also was sort of interested in furniture and wanted nicer furniture than I could afford. So I got I fell down this rabbit hole of of trying to make things and thinking that I could make anything and really kind of like diving deep into that process. That's interesting. So when you're you know, making this work that's so inviting the viewer to to open a cabinet, you know, to smell something. How are you thinking about them in your making process? Are you, you know, considering that as you're making? Are you thinking about how you yourself as a person would use it? Maybe you could talk a little bit more about that. Yeah. 
Um, I think that one of the my favorite things about uh, showing and making furniture is that people get to touch it. And it's so unlike painting or sculpture in a gallery where people get to, I invite people to interact with it and to use it. And I feel like to me, and one of the huge benefits of being at the craft center has been um, that I feel like my work doesn't get activated until someone's interacting with it or using it. And so to have the work open to the public to be able to engage with really completes the, the loop for me. Um, so I, I, you know, as a furniture maker, I'm sort of trained to think about how people are going to interact with things on a logistical level, um, how the, how the pull feels in your fingers or how this door kind of opens up what you can kind of put in these things. And from there really sort of, I think about, um, the tactile nature of furniture in how I'm making things too. I, uh, think that there's a really strong, um, I use my hands a lot to see things. And so while I'm building, um, I could tell if something is not quite there or not quite right or not quite smooth based on how it feels more accurately than how it looks. And so these are all things that I kind of put into the furniture. And then the kind of curious and inquisitive part of me was, interested in pushing that to the next level. And so I think that um, I'm interested in how the tactile sensation adds to the overall experience that the viewer has. And is there a way to incorporate sound or scent or, you know, really kind of activating multiple levels of interaction for the pieces? Great. Yeah, that's really interesting. Um, we have a question from your fellow resident, Lakia. Um, Lakia asks that due to your intricate carving process, have you ever considered making some of your handmade tools yourself? She also adds that the process is very inspiring and um, that the tool selection is a direct indicator of your style. <laughs> oh, that is sweet. Um, I missed the like key word on that through technical. Um, have, have you ever considered making your own tools or do you make your own tools? You know, since they're already highly stylized and already made, do you make your own is her question. Yes, yes. And actually, you know, really fits into the question I just answered. Um, but the feeling of the tool is really important to how the tool uses, where you could have two tools that are equally, um, you know, like refined or sharp or, or kind of functional. But if they don't uh, feel good in your hands, if they don't sing, then they then they kind of fall flat. And so for me, it's really fun to take something um, to, or to make something that's not out of the box and to really like, how do I want to interact with this tool? How does this feel in my hands? Oh, it's a little too big. I can cut it in half or I can, you know, glue a piece together to make it bigger. So it's really, it's one, it's kind of like liberating and two, it's, um, you know, it's a whole other rabbit hole of just places you can go with it. I think Lakia also wants you to sell your tools. Uh, maybe she's interested oh. in them. That was also her question too. <laughs> cool. um, we, we have one last question from the audience of, do you know, do you ever use found wood, um, you know, wood from fallen trees when you're in places, you know, how are you sourcing some of these materials or your actual material you're working with? Uh, yes and no. Um, Furniture grade wood is is oftentimes um, a little bit more, uh, you know, for one, it has to be really dry in order to use. And there's a lot of kind of like practical concerns with woods um, that are, you know, quote unquote found. Um, so I don't have too much of a practice of using um, wood that I find, but I am I am kind of active in using wood that is harvested um, in the area that I am. Sometimes I'm harvesting the wood. Um, it's a little bit more of a of an active process in the role, and it's not something that you can kind of like passively find. But um, you know, I have wood that I've collected that's really particular to the place that it's from, which feels really special when you get to build something and say that it's like, oh, this wood is from my backyard in Vermont, or this wood came from someone's yard that, you know, I really cared about. And then I got to make it into something special. Yeah, that makes sense. That makes sense. So what's next for you after you wrap up at the craft center? 
Um, I will be attending Cranbrook for my MFA. That's very exciting, Miles. Thank you. Awesome. Well, I want to thank you, Miles, for sharing your studio today. There's quite the um, conversation in the chat about how you need to start selling your tools. So, you know, think about other side of your business practice. <laughs> um, I want to mention how Miles um, brought up our May 6th Hands-On Houston, where he's helping to teach uh, soap carving. And that's a free event from 11 to 3 on May 6th. It's for families, adults, anyone who would like to attend. And he also has a May 13th um, wood carving workshop that's sold out though. So if you're interested in being added to the wait list, please email us. You can find it on our event page. So thank you so much, Miles, for sharing your studio and your practice. We um, enjoyed getting to know it today. Thanks, Natalie. Thank you. Okay. And last but certainly not least, we have one more resident, Yeonsu Kim. In order to understand the art, history, and culture of ceramics in Korea, Yeonsu worked with Korean masters at various Ongi factories and ceramic studios as a way to secure a stronghold in the field of Korean traditional pottery. He was born in Hinam, South Korea, and earned his MFA in ceramics at Lamar Dodd School of Art at the University of Georgia and his BFA in ceramics and glass from Hangai University located in Seoul, Korea. He has held apprenticeships with Anki masters in Juala-do and Hong yi san do in Korea. Um, he has won multiple awards and exhibited nationally and internationally. Most recently, he was named one of the top six emerging artists of 2020 from the National Council on the Education of the Ceramic Arts and had a solo exhibition at the Radius Gallery in, Miss in Montana. He has participated in artist residencies, including the Korean Ceramic Foundation, Montana State University, and the Mor um, Morian Clay Center and the Archie Bray Foundation. So Yensu, I'm gonna hand it over to you. And I should say Yensu has been here for nine months and it's also wrapping up at the end of May. So you have another month to visit Yensu in his studio as well. Awesome, thanks Yensu, over to you. Uh, hello, I just wanna share your screen. Uh, here you go. And... Okay. Uh, my name is Yansu Kim, one of the residents at, uh, at the Krebs, Contemporary Krebs Center in Houston. So I'm actually originally from South Korea. So actually, in our case, I born in actually small island. So that's why my artist aesthetics from my background and experience and I was a kid. So I totally exposed by nature, which means uh, play swimming, I'm go swimming, go fishing is my job, but also my life and I was a kid. Uh, I, I still remember that memory with my mom and then one night she asking to me, why don't you bring some soaping paste? And uh, which means some of you know familiar with the Korean culture or not, but uh, fermented food is the essential part of the Korean's life. So that's why we've been enjoying uh, eating kimchi and serving paste and so hot pepper paste and fundamental you know, aspect and foundation in the Korean's life. So I didn't expect making ongi pot when I was growing up. Uh, but this is my favorite part since being, you know, early 20s. And uh, that side, actually human size over the one meter and then I really into it. And he is my Mr. Uh, Hyang jong who is my first Ongi teacher. And uh, I met him when he doing the Ongi Bokushan in Korea. And I just amazing by his skill and his passion about making art. So that's why I asked to him, can I learn from him? And then thankfully he accepted my proposal and that's what happened. And uh, at the time he running the Ongi factory. So my job during the day, you know, just nine to five working on the factory, loading the killing and making clay and, you know, fighting. And even I just, you know, delivery, you know, Ongi part into the uh, stores. And right after done by my job Dury, and I start uh, learning from, you know, Ongi, how to make it. So that's why it's been tough, 
because you know highly demand a lot of you know effort mentally, uh, physically, even spiritually. Really tough, but I learned a lot from him. So this is my first time ever made ongi. It's not perfect around it because you know it's my it was my first time to make, but I love it. I still I can see you know my passion and memories and time. And eventually my skill set and improve their practicing the time. So that's why I can handle it every single steps. After that, after undergraduate, I decided to pursue another uh, apprenticeship. Um, luckily I met him during the you know, festival. So I really into making oil coils. And the first time making ongi bar actually made by uh, the slab tech company. But depends on even though Korea is not that big country, but every peninsula has different techniques. So that's why, oh, if I can handle both techniques, it's gonna be good. So that's why I decided to pursue another method. I mean, apprentice with the uh, ongi master. So that's why I started again. You know, there is no shortcut. I you know, try to as I can work a lot. So repetition is the best way to improve my skill set. And also I learned a lot from him, you know. So apprenticeship actually, you know, not only enhance my skill set, but also I can learn a lot from them, which means I can see their lifestyle, how can manage the time, how can handle the business, you know. So that's why if it's like, you know, total life lesson. So if I will learn from academia, I, I have no idea how to handle it out of school. But through that time, I have some senses, you know, how can I managing and running my studio. So eventually I get handling, you know, ONGI and I can make not only small stuff, but also I can make a bigger stuff. So through that time, not only uh, enhance my skills, that but also I can find all my identity. So I'm so proud of that time. I'm I'm so lucky to having this, you know, tradition athletics from Korea. So here is my Ongi garden. And uh, I just set up the, not only small object and different, you know, shapes and, you know, functional, the part. So yeah, here we go. My wanna, you know, reference where it came from and what, what is my influence by my own art practice. I'm a huge fan of the Korean tradition ceramics, one of the big inspiration from Bunchong Stone. I love the contrast between a clay body and you know, decoration like that. Uh, and also I like the layered, you know, through that when I drawing on the pot. And also I'm huge inf influenced by Mina, which means a Korean focal painting. And uh, I love the imagination and I love the, that present their life and uh, imaginative and, you know, creative, you know, storytelling. So here is my working process and you guys can see more understanding how to be able to handle, you know, a slab technique. And here is a way to make it, you know, slab methods and, uh, after making you know slab and then put on the floor and then adding more clay and then paddling. So so that's why when I make the big part, I need a big coach like that. So you know to save time. And then second video, uh, how to show you know adding coils. So sometimes when I doing the demoing, I want to show two way of the technique in terms of, you know, education. So I just want to show it in, uh, depends on condition of clay body, which means if I working with the hard clay, I prefer actually slab coil, I mean slab technique. When I working in the soft clay condition, I, I use the uh, coil techniques. And then my inspiration from the, my doodling and drawing. So I've been just you know, keeping diary about 
writing about my thoughts and ideas. And also I just, I've been enjoying, you know, uh, doodling. It feels like warming up, you know, before back to, you know, touch the clay or creating something. So I've been enjoying it a lot. And uh, so here is the way of the decoration. This is, you know, secret piece of technique. So after I apply the black underglaze, you know, I just grip the, you know, metal needle tool and then I just, you know, draw. Depending on sizes, it takes, you know, a couple of days sometime. And uh, I don't want to dry completely because if I dry, you know, all of pieces, you know, it's going to be challenging. So that's why I just, after draw, I just fully covering up, you know, with a plastic bag. So, and then, I just take, you know, script off the background, you know, to contrast between, you know, clay itself with uh, underglazed colors. So this is one of my favorite techniques that I'm working on it. Yeah, definitely need to take time to effort. So it takes, you know, a couple of days, depending on, you know, sizes, as you know, so. And, and also I've been enjoying creating all my storytelling. Somehow I'm a huge fan of the uh, narrative story. So that's why I've been enjoying, you know, play with that certain stories. So I hugely influenced by nature. And also in terms of subject matter, relationships is the big, you know, stories about myself and even my work. So that's why I just play with some of my inspiration, and both not only they present you know sky and also delivery message and beyond you know something and also I just collect some of my favorite items. Fish is one of the favorite items. Not only bring my memory with my kid I and mean, when I'm a kid, but also I just missing the ocean and you know stories. So sometimes I play with the world pieces. So I used to actually make you know, three dimensional pieces, but at some point I'm thinking about, you know, try to approach differently. Otherwise, you know, I couldn't make something different. So as you can see a lot of drawing on it, and then this is using by, you know, calligraphy plus drawing. Uh, I've been thinking a lot, how can I keep, you know, enhancing the line quality? At some point, I just display, just go for it. So sometimes, People start drawing, I just bring sketching and ideas. And then somehow I like the liveness, which means I don't want a duplication, replication. So that's why, even though I have a plan, and but at the same time, I feel like no plan is a good plan sometimes. So that's why I just keep playing with them. And sometimes I just spray, apply different glazing. This is one of my favorite ones. And a uh, lot of things going on. and. Sometimes I feel like, you know, am I doing too much? But somehow, you know, you know, to make something new, I try to approach, you know, one more steps. Sometimes it's good, sometimes, you know, not that good, but I just want to keep play with that. So, you know, to make something new, exploring and try something new is the, I just keep in mind. So that's why I try to collaboration and, keep approaching differently. And uh, since pandemic, I'm thinking a lot about what is my priority. So that's why I'm thinking about time is a priority. So that's why I just wanna keep, you know, describe about memory and time, you know, these days. So that's why I'm curious about what, what you're gonna have inside, outside. So those pieces actually represent my thoughts and ideas. And this is one of my favorite one. So here, here, here is my, you know, residence in Houston. So living in Houston, big city, a lot of traffic, a lot of diversity, friendly, you know, environment. I've been enjoying a lot. So since being last September. So here is here is my studio view. So you guys can see a lot of you know artwork and different aspects. And uh, you guys can see wall pieces and also three-dimensional. And then um, lately I'm doing some you know, decoration on the plate. So that residency, you know, 
providing private studio and then 24 seven access, you know, the building. So it's been great time to be here. And here is a short clip to show my, this is my work. So since I've been here, I'm more focusing on time effort to develop all my skill, I mean, decorations in terms of decoration. So I try to uh, play with a lot of, you know, colors. So that's why you guys can see uh, a lot of these. So uh, I like the self trait and then I just play with, you know, enjoying the relationships and some topics and ideas and environment. So that's why I'm doing here. And also good thing about living in Houston, there, is a, there are some, you know, art festival in town. So luckily I had a chance to uh, participate in the Bay Art Festival. So that's what, that's the good thing about experience living in Houston. So every Tuesday and Saturday, I uh, put studio at, you know, my, you know, studio. So that's why I met a lot of people, you know, communities, and uh, it's been good time to share my own experience and knowledge to the public, but also I also, enjoying listen to people on perspective so that's the really good you know time to hang out with the people so that's the good time be here and lately i'm working on creating narrative narrative vessel so i've been enjoying it a lot so i just keep develop in terms of scale i mean the sizes i job and also i try different colors that's my plan and my my further plan actually i just want to create a different you know approach of making but also i try to make more size up and also i'm more interesting about how can i show to the people so that's why i'm trying to do installation pieces rather than make single every single item so that's my plan and i still believe most personal is the most creativity so I usually influence by, you know, certain, even though different area, I usually influence by, you know, art director and, you know, other artists. So I still believe it. And yeah, it's an easy time to share it, you know, from the beginning to, to you know, currently what I'm working on in Houston. So, but thank you for having me and listen and my, you know, experience, yeah, the residency at Houston. So thank you. Thank you, Yunsu, for taking us through your practice. And I love seeing all the mini works you've made here and such a range of works from your, you know, 3D pieces to your scraffito to your ceramic works here. And I wanted to ask you a question about something you said at the very beginning about working with the um, Onji, um, Onji professors and, and masters that you worked with and about how you know, they really taught you so much and, you know, you mm -hmm. teach a lot yourself. You're always doing workshops. You're always sharing your practice. And what does it mean to you to teach as an artist now and to share your practice? All my career, I've been thinking a lot in answer my skill set. And also I just want to be like them, which means, you know, there are a lot of uh, ceramic hero out there. Oh, this is my dreaming about to be full-time artist. And not only as an artist, but also instructor. So at some point I'm thinking a lot, what's the meaning and what's the purpose of my life for the future? So that's why it's time to giving back to community. So that's why I've been enjoying sharing my experience and knowledge to the even student, no matter what age groups, it's been great time. And I'm so blessed to be having opportunities also uh, this time. So it means a lot for me. I just want to keep doing this. Yeah. That's great. Well, building on that, we have a question from GA that's asking about what is your future or what are your um what are your future goals as a full-time artist? Where do you go from here? Uh definitely uh I just wanna keep prolific maker at some point. That's how I learned from my teachers and my experience. Rather than thinking too much, I just wanna uh keep working hard but at some point i not only 
enjoying my job, but also I just try to balance between as an artist, but also as a human being. So that's why I just want to more balance and hang out with my family and friends. And also I just want to enjoy every single moment rather than thinking too much. So that's what I'm trying to do. And I, I don't know, there are a lot of definition, you know, who is the successful as an artist. But for me, I just want to enjoy it. And I, I just want to show my work to the people and to the world. That's my dream goal. And I just want to enjoy it. So, yeah. I love how your work, as you talked about it, is like a visual diary of what's going on. And I know you've explained certain, you know, symbols or um, illustrations, but do mm -hmm. you, and you mentioned the peach and the sea, but do you have symbols that come up in your illustrations that you use over and over that, you know, represent anything or are they more doodles in the moment? I think both. So in terms of what's the priority, my life. So I'm thinking a lot myself. I didn't think about that much when I was in Korea, but since moving here, uh, I try to figure out who am I and what do you really want to do? So that's why I should spend time with myself. And so what are you interested about? What are you going to do? And what time you happy during the day? So that's why I've been figuring out, you know, knowing more about detail, you know, every single steps and also that's why I try to collect happiness mm -hmm. memories. So that's why I'm trying to collect a you know, favorite item, fishes, bird, bird, and even some animal. And like you said, you know, like you be on some, you know, pottery shape, one of my favorite, you know, bottle and ceramic jar shape and vessel form. They are also my biggest inspiration. And also since moving to Houston, I usually influenced by this environment, you know, that's why my imagery from pop up some, you know, rocket and, you know, yeah, cowboy boots, you know, Texas and Houston. And also, you know, I can access to Galveston beaches. So that's why I'm putting some shells and some, you know, so I think inspiration everywhere. So that's why I try to, to go with and then play with them. And also I still believe my instincts. Somehow I try to allow my weakness at the same time emptiness. That's the more bring more freedom and also that's a more exciting part of this one. If I make a perfect plan, sometimes good, but sometimes too much stress about it, you know? That's why even though I will bring some, you know, 40, 50% plan and then just 50, let it go. And sometimes good, sometimes not, but that's my plan, <laughs> yes. I, I like how I like how you let it go and just leave it to be. That's, you know, a really freeing, it feels like a very freeing way of, of working. Yes. We have one last question for you. Oh, we have two questions too. Um, so one is, what is your um, favorite place in Houston to get inspiration for your work? Definitely Museum District. And also Bemil Collection is one of my favorite, you know, place to go. If you chance to visit Houston, you should definitely go Houston Contemporary Museum and yeah, Museums, you know, Fine Art Houston. Mm -hmm. And, but for me, Mamie collection is my favorite one. So whenever I go to visit, wow, it's so impressive by, you know, and also the collection, not only African artwork, but also uh, surrealism artists, you know, Picasso, Marguerite, and, you know, Dali, and uh, so much going on. So that's my biggest inspiration in Houston, yeah. yeah. That's wonderful. So you wrap up your residency at the end of May, just like Miles and Margo. Where are you going after the residency? I'm going to North Carolina, you know, to uh, doing another residency. So I'm excited. At the same time, I feel sad, you know, living in Houston. It's been a good time. So, yeah. Well, I always say once you are part of our residency program, you're part of our community for other, forever, whether you like it or not. So you'll still <laughs> continue to be part of our community. Um, I want to thank you, Yansu, for taking the time to share your practice with us today. Again, you have another month um, to visit Yansu in his studio before he leaves. And we did have a question from Jerry about will these talks be on um, on view later or will these talks be available later? And yes, Jerry, after this um, 
lectures over, they'll be posted to Facebook. So you can go on the Craft Center Facebook page and search for it there. And we do try to add them to our YouTube page eventually as well. So lots of opportunities to share these wonderful practices of these artists and to dive deeper. I want to thank you all for spending part of your Friday, Saturday, not Friday, Saturday afternoon with us. We'll have two more artist talks later this summer with our last four residents of this cycle. So I want to thank Yansu, Margo, and Miles for opening up their studio to us. And everyone have a great rest of your afternoon. Thank you. Mm -hmm.